today we are entering the criminal legal system um, through its entry point, I guess, um, policing and surveillance that too often remain gray areas in our conversations on fair trial rights, um, because we start talking about safeguards a bit too late down the line. Um, so today we're gonna try to remedy that. And by we, I mean these incredible panelists um, that are gonna introduce themselves in a second. Um, but first, let me do a little overview of what I believe we're gonna talk about today. Um, um, we're going to talk about the expansion of policing powers that has been once again um, initiated under the state of emergency during the COVID-19 health crisis, um, where governments saw an opportunity to, again, increase repression and fear mongering. But this is absolutely not the first time we've seen this. It's just an, a reminder of how readily states will entrust and empower the police and military in some cases um, to enforce social control. Uh, with no regard for the rule of law or democratic oversight. Um, and this is, of course, bad for everyone, but it's far from neutrally bad or equally bad. Um, we know that racialized communities bear the brunt of this increase in competencies and power of the police. Um, and we've seen this in generalized instances of police brutality. Uh, we've seen this with the disproportionate policing of Roma neighborhoods during the pandemic, for instance. Um, we've seen this in, in previous increases in police power directly targeted at migrant communities, at Muslim communities. Um, and a lot of people who are much more intelligent than me uh, talk about an infrastructure of racialized suspicion that is also facilitated by increasing reliance on technology and surveillance and automated decision making that replicate this bias that exists in the police um, and in a system that continues being in denial about it. Um, so the idea behind this panel today is to discuss how can we resist an ever expanding system um, based on state power that is embedded in structural racism um, and how can justice really be achieved if this is the gateway to the system. Um, so now, joining me in this conversation that uh, is complex, we see Ojaku being like, I hope we can talk about it. Um, I would like to invite um, each of you. So we have Ojaku Nobuzo from INAR. Uh, we have Noura Albachlul from CAGE. We have Griff Ferris from Fair Trials. Uh, and we have Chloe Barthélemy from EDRI. Um, and I personally dislike when other people introduce me. So I thought I'd give you 30 seconds to introduce yourselves. Uh, and maybe just to set the mood, tell us what brings you into this work or where do you draw hope for the work that you're doing? And maybe I can start so that not to go. <laughs> um, so I'm Joanna. I feel like I did not say my name since the beginning of this, which is, um, I'm Joanna, I work at Fair Trials. Um, and injustice gets me really, really furious. And that's my motivation when I wake up in the morning to do what I do. Voila, who wants to go next? I'll see Noura then. <laughs> Hello, I'm Noura. I'm here on behalf of CAGE. And basically we are working to empower communities impacted by the war on terror. So I'm here um, based in Vienna and I'm going to shed some light on Austria and how to empower or how we did empower the community in the past year where, you know, the past year was one of the most Draconian years there was in the history of Austria. <laughs> and yeah, more to that later on. Super. Um, Ojaku? Hello, yes, I'm Ojaku. I'm a senior research officer at INA. Um, hopefully I will talk about um, our most recent report and the work that we've been doing around police <laughs> brutality and community resistance. And I've been working for several years in uh, like in racial justice um, organizations and um, it still remains uh, a priority and an important thing for me to work on. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Chloe? Yeah, hi. Um, so my name is Chloe Bertelemy. I'm policy advisor at EDRI, European Digital Rights, which is kind of a network organization representing 
um, NGOs across Europe um, that promote and defend uh, fundamental rights at the digital era, as we call it. So everything that has something related to technologies and um, the internet. Um, I'm leading the work there on law enforcement. Um, and so sometimes like the motivation I have to do this work is to think that I can be the small blip in the excessively well-oiled machinery that is law enforcement at EU level. And that gives me joy to think that maybe I can be one day considered as a small stone in the foot of the European Commission or the or Europol. Uh, that is amazing. We love that for you. Uh, Griff, can you follow, follow up on that? Hey, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Griff. I work at Fair Trials. Uh, I work on uh, pre-trial detention, plea bargaining, um, and other elements of criminal justice. Um, and I also lead our work on, on algorithms, data, and other automated systems in policing and criminal justice. Um, I share with Ioana what she said about injustice and the anger at injustice. Um, I also agree with Chloe. I think we all want to be the stones in the shoes of people in power and abusing that power. And if we're all stones in their shoes, then they're going to have a lot of stones in their shoes. Um, but I'm also motivated by the possibility of a world where people are free from disproportionate, uh, violent and discriminatory use of criminal, criminal powers. That was all very inspiring. You, did, you all did very, very well. Um, so now I'm going to let you present um, your work basically before we launch into a conversation. I just really wanna encourage people who are um, attending to write questions, to write comments. Uh, this is a learning process. And I, I, I wanted to, to start with this actually, a lot of what I know, I know from you and from joint work and from cross movement work and from reading your reports. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and a lot of times they say very intelligent stuff and I'm like, yeah, I read that in a report written by Ojako and I'm like, I'm, I'm happy you're here, is what I'm saying. Um, so let me turn to Ojaku first. Um, let's, let's set the scene. We're, we're talking a lot about, about police brutality, about police violence, about why this expansion um, of policing powers is um, extremely dangerous, especially for racialized communities. Uh, and to put this in perspective a little, um, we've all, I think, been made more aware of what's going on um, with the murder of George Floyd in the United States and ensuring Black Lives Matter protests. But this was by no means new or, or only happening in the States. Um, just to mention a couple of cases, we know the, of the killing of Adama Traoré in France, I think in 2016. So quite some time before, um, again, just one of the many, many cases very recently, uh, a year ago, Tomasz, uh, Tomasz Stanislav in, in the Czech Republic. Um, and again, the COVID health crisis was just one of the emergencies that have been met with an increase of police powers. And we know these emergencies have actually been humanitarian crisis. Um, so can you tell us more about, about your, your observations on this expansion of policing since I think 2015 um, this, it's, and its discriminatory impact? Yeah, I mean, um, thank you very much for, for that question. I think the discussion around the, the relationship between the police and individual liberties is, is not a new one. Um, I think with the murder of George Floyd and these kind of like winds of change, we hoped that, uh, you know, after 2020, that we, progress was finally within our reach. However, the practices, the racist practices of policing um, that have been a part of Europe for decades and decades still continues two years after the murder of George Floyd. So um, I won't go as far back as 20, 2015, um, but I will focus, <laughs> I will focus on um, the work that we have done in, in the last uh, year, um, specifically around the report that we, we, we wrote, um, which is looking at police brutality and community resistance. And I want to say that although the report was focusing on more recent times, it does highlight um, kind of the persistent patterns um, where you see somebody, a uh, racialized individual gets killed or injured by the police. Um, often there is some sort of uprising. <clears throat> And then potentially there's a, a kind of like national or 
institutional inquiry or response. And then it's followed by quite limited change in policing practices. And we saw this um, essentially with um, the murder of George Floyd and the death of George Floyd. This pattern has been occurring for many, many years. So um, one thing that our work also focused on was uh, the additional kind of policing powers around or during COVID-19, um, which essentially was enforce, enforcing social control and um, opened up the possibility of abuse. So in 2020, we saw further criminalization of freedom of movement, homelessness, informal work, protests, um, filming of police officers, um, just being in public spaces, um, criminalization of migration, of course, and support to migrants. And what we have found is that racialized communities were significantly impacted by the pandemic and all of these um, extension of policing powers. Um, and it's essentially these patterns, these racist patterns of policing that continue every single um, year or, or, or for whatever crisis um, occurs. And um, I think it's incredibly contradictory during the, the COVID um, pandemic that we saw so many um, um, disproportionate policing and also harmful policing when you look to the police to protect society and and hopefully help um, support public health um, but we saw during COVID-19 that this was not the case one of the uh, some of the data that we found um, particularly in France saw that during the first 45 days of lockdown there were six times more deaths in custody than the time before then um, so this really highlights that contradictory um, kind of policing practice around public safety. And I think it will be really important over the next year, years or so to see to what extent those emergency laws have been completely removed or if they have been some way kind of in, integrated into those legal structures and systems. And um, when I talk about uh, racialized communities, um, let me just expand on that so that we, we share the same understanding. Essentially, race, racialization is a process that is very complex, um, but it's a process in which groups um, come to be designated um, as a particular race. And on that basis, they're subject to differential and unequal treatment. And you can see how this racialization process really occurs in policing and law enforcement. And it's this process which is really essentially the root of structural bias in, in law enforcement. And um, we understand that the police have a great level of uh, discretionary power that allows them to, to, to kind of enforce, um, enforce certain laws um, which may allow them to justify violence and racist practices. But it's important to, to understand that, that those practices and that policing operates with a common set of norms that part of, of a broader structure that sees the dehumanization of racialized groups in a variety of ways. And so these norms and this structure can foster um, a culture of impunity where acts of racism are often not held to account. So this is another thing that we find very much. So it's not just the, the incidents of um, racism and racist um, policing, but then the, the officers who are the perpetrators are, are often not held to account. And we see that this is normalized within our society, within the European political structures, um, and that the, the violence is somehow tolerated um, by society. And this goes back to my point about how deep rooted racism is and how complex it is, um, because it, it, it's obviously to do with the police, but also it includes judges and pros um, prosecutors, medical experts, and then of course the, um, uh, the wider public. So um, I think if we even think about COVID-19 and how certain activities were criminalized to begin with, we again see how um, the, the racist practices are reinforced. Um, some um, very small 
kinds of um, offences, being in, in certain public areas, um, were criminalised. And therefore, you can see how that can lead to some people being fined um, or disproportionately fined. And then also some people being potentially um, incarcerated. Um, and then we see, we have to ask ourselves, are these small level, low level offences really relevant or important enough for us to, to end up in, into incarceration? Um, so these are some of the questions that we raise in our report, as well as to talk about not just policing as we understand like traditional forms of policing, but also we talk about um, private security, militia, and, and, and this is, in, I think, particularly important um, in the context of Europe, where some of the EU agencies are using um, more private security firms or companies to, to kind of implement some of their um, activities, um, especially around EU border management and and control. So we try to highlight in our report like um, how state oppression can manifest in Europe and um, through not just um, brutality, but also bureaucratic means and cultural means, economic means and geographic means. Um, and so I, can't, I think I've come to my five minutes, so I'll stop there and, um, and say thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for disclosing the secret five minutes, Ojak. Um, this is not scripted, everyone. Uh, I promise. Um, this was this was uh, very very good. Um, I know you don't don't need a validation, but I think uh, that ties us directly into Nura's intervention because you're you're talking about how the police um, is one of the the stakeholders um, in a system. Uh, that functions when all the actors come together, basically. Um, and as Nora was saying, um, sorry, let me get the view off here. Um, what we've witnessed in Austria last year um, is one of the most prominent and largely uncontested deployments of state power, not only via the police, via the police, but clearly with the backing of other structures and systems. Uh, directly targeted at the Muslim community under the pretext of the fight against terrorism. Um, and Noura, if you can tell us more about the largest ever peacetime police raids, um, an Islamophobic state-sponsored intervention named Operation Luxor. Um, uh, I'll, just, yes, sure. I'll just let you do this. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing first. I think um, the topic of this um, this conference is highly, highly interesting, especially because you have this focus on pandemic. Um, and when I was like reading up my notes, I was like, it's crazy how many things happened in Austria during the pandemic. And I will come to that in a few minutes. But uh, to start with Operation Luxor, which happened also during the pandemic and actually during a lockdown as well here in Austria. It was, as you mentioned, the largest ever police raid in Austria's peacetime history. And by the way, before that, um, the largest ever police raid was Operation Spring, which targeted the Black community in 1999. And now in 2020, Operation Luxor was carried out, um, targeting exclusively solely the Muslim community and key actors in our community. Um, there are some very hard facts around Operation Luxor. First, it all happened under the ambiguous term of political Islam, which is a government invented term. And many, many measures against the Muslim community were carried out specific under this um, pretext of so-called political Islam. And by the way, even though never defined by the government, but we all know what it means because the hijab ban, proposed Sharia bans, mosque closures all happened under the pretext of so-called political Islam. And also Operation Luxor happened under the pretext of political Islam. By the way, also the Austrian government um, equates it with um, terrorism. So it all hap uh, also happened under the pretext of combating uh, terrorism, whatever the power defines, however the power defines uh, terrorism in the first place. And um, when it comes to the key findings all around Operation Luxor, I feel like um, we have all these hard facts around Operation Luxor, but compared to how hard, like how terrible these facts are, people haven't really paid that much attention to it. So um, what we did is we compiled a report um, with a specific focus on Operation Luxor, where we conducted interviews and uh, witness testimonies of the survivors of Operation Luxor. 
um, because we all know if you don't document these rights violations, it's as if they never happened. And this is something which is very alarming for, or should be very alarming for us all here, because uh, the thing is, if, if we wouldn't have documented them, um, nobody would have. And we documented them as part of the target community. So we just, um, we just learned the techniques, how to conduct interviews, et cetera, to be able to document it. But the um, organizations who have actually the mandate to document them um, weren't documenting it. So we have this really huge gap when it comes to Austria as well, which is why um, I want to specifically focus on operation, uh, operation Luxor and the rights violations. So we have on the one hand, the children's rights violations where 62 children were targeted. The youngest one was 10 years old. Um, where police was uh, aiming their guns at 5 a.m. in the morning at the 10, 10 days old, old baby, basically. Um, and also the UN Children's Rights Convention, which was severely um, um, violated as well. We have the human rights violations when it comes to Operation Luxor, the right to a fair trial. The survivors of Operation Luxor weren't given um, access to their own files. Their lawyers weren't given access to their own files as well for almost three months. Uh, the presumption of innocence where the media played a key role in that as well, just basically spreading fake news and acting as a speaker's phone of the government. And, um, and the list goes on and on and on. And I would highly recommend to read the report. Maybe we can send it in there into the chat or something. <laughs> there you can also read up all the witness testimonies. We also interviewed or I interviewed a teenage girl actually who also um, told her story. So this is something we have been working on um, as well. We are empowering the community here in Austria and the survivors of Operation Luxor to tell the stories, to put them on stage. And this is what we ask also other NGOs to do, um, to also listen to the directly impacted and the survivors of the so um, dramatic and draconian measures we are talking about all right now. Um, and yeah, and so now having, you know, hopefully a little bit of an overview um, of Operation Luxor and how bad it was, um, I can come to how it actually happened. Because obviously Operation Luxor and the rights violations I just mentioned are the result of institutional Islamophobia. So basically Islamophobic actors were given the power position to act on their Islamophobia. And you were mentioning before, Iona, um, suspicion. Um, because whole Operation Luxor is based on suspicion. There's not even one, one evidence so that people could um, be sued. There's, there's, everything is based on suspicion. Now um, the status quo is that allegations have already been dropped, but the rights violations are still there. So what we have also experienced when it comes to surveillance, um, because the survivors were observed for one and a half years, phone calls, everything. It was declared as unlawful like two months ago or something. But this right violation is still here and there's no accountability whatsoever. So the police who basically um, invaded and terrorized um, the Mus like Muslim families have experienced no accountability till now, but also the government officials, right? And the Islamophobic actors who sit in, a, in an own uh, documentation center, state-led and state finance documentation center. Um, and this is now I want to come to that, how actually Operation Luxor could happen. So we have to understand that this is the result of Islamophobia and institutional Islamophobia. Otherwise, this couldn't have happened. And also including the children's rights violations we're talking about right now. Um, so basically what the governing, governing party was doing or the UFOP party slash Kurz party. Now it's not Kurz party anymore because Kurz had to resign the former chancellor because it was revealed that he was manipulating public opinion so he had to resign. So you can see how bad it is in Austria right now. <laughs> um, and um, so basically what he was doing or what his party is doing is establishing institutions like the Documentation Center Against Political Islam. And again, this Documentation Center Against Political Islam was established during a pandemic a few months before Operation Luxor, um, where they are basically officially saying they're monitoring us here in Austria as Muslims and um, and surveilling us here in Austria and listing us here in Austria. So also other pro projects include the Islam map, where 600 organizations, Muslim market organizations were um, um, pub like published in an own address, even including private addresses and, and et cetera. So this documentation center was established during a pandemic. It is state led, state financed and very you know, famous um, Islamophobic actors are sitting in there writing studies, spreading fake science and fake like literally fake studies, including, you know, the kindergarten study, 
um, Operation Luxor was based on the study these Islamophobic actors were putting together and on, on this grounds Operation Luxor could have, like was carried out basically, right? But also the hijab ban, all of these are based on fake science and this is something we have to address I think as well when it comes to counter extremism, right? This all includes fake science, um, also Operation Luxor includes fake science, but also the hijab ban, the kindergarten study, all of that um, Muslims are constructed as a social problem or are made responsible for social problems. Then the same ones who are um, basically um, compiling those studies uh, are spreading these fake um, science into the society. In Austria, society accepts it without resistance. And, and then the same ones who are creating these studies are coming up with a so-called solution in form of anti-terror act, Operation Luxor, et cetera, and all of these measures, like you name it, and we have all these specific um, um, uh, national context um, here as well. But basically, this is how they come up with um, all these draconian measures against the Muslim community. And um, yeah, so I, obvi obviously I have only a few minutes, but I was hoping that in these few minutes I can tease some questions or some you know, um, topics we can maybe maybe later on discuss. Obviously, this is a huge topic, you know, Operation Luxor, counter extremism in Austria, where there's also a very specific gap, you know, when it comes to counter extremism and in, in Austria. Um, we have more of the, um, most of the studies are focusing on UK, but in Austria, it's still a very much a gap. So maybe we can also have this in a conversation. Um, and um, yeah, so this is from my side and hopefully we can go more into detail later on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nora. That was very powerful. And also you already teased my transition. Um, so um, for those who have studied the agenda day and night, as I know many of our attendees have, um, you will be noticing that we have a panelist missing, and this is Erika Farkas from the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, um, who was going to talk about um, the military gaining policing powers. So even beyond policing, um, the military under the pretext of emergency powers gaining absolute powers to enter people's houses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think this ties into what Nura has just mentioned about law violations and what Ojaku uh, was hinting towards with like provisions put in law under emergency powers that don't really have a sunset clause, clause and like they never really disappear. They just stay there forever. Um, and I just wanted to make this point that I'm sure Erica would have made about um, we we still have a lot of faith in the law. We hear of these violations. So we're imagining that, oh, but there must be, this must be illegal. There must be recourse. There must be repercussions, right? Um, there's a lot of, of this, I think, this perception. I know we have a lot of lawyers in the room and I don't want to disillusion you at all. Um, that, that legal instruments exist. They will be applied. The system will function and will, in a way, um, redress harm, um, but what do you do when the when all of these provisions become law and then this is the law and we go further and further into enabling widespread viola violation into uh, including our racism and our Islamophobia into law and then acting on it, um, as Nura was saying. So I think that is one reflection point um, that we should um, reflect on, I guess. Um, I'm speaking English, ladies and gentlemen, and non-binary people. Um, so moving on to, um, to technology um, and to, I know, Ojako, I, I see you, same. Um, so we're talking about policing and criminal justice that are, are evolving, expanding, including in scale. And that is also happening um, due to the increasing use of technology. Um, and as I understand the technology is, created by humans and replicates these biases that um, we've been talking about up until now. So one area of great concern is how will we, how, how will we run these programs that actually, and how much more harm exponentially will they do just by replicating human bias? And one of these uh, concerns, some of these concerns um, are around the use of artificial intelligence in predictive policing models. And I had to read this off a paper but now Griff will explain what this means, um, how this bias is replicated and why, again, um, it 
poses a danger of exacerbating inequality. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Um, so we've heard so far from Ojaku and Nora a fair bit about how police and policing in, in Europe has worked recently. Um, you know, specific cases of um, what's gone on, incidents that have happened, groups and individuals, individuals and groups who have been targeted um, and what the what is going on with predictive policing is all of that information, all of the data on the individuals and groups that are targeted, that have been targeted historically, that information is used by police and other criminal justice authorities to make predictions about who is going to commit crime in the future. So the police use their, uh, their um, reports on who they've arrested, who, where they've had reports of crimes, um, you know, the areas where they have traditionally policed. Um, they use all of this information to try and uh, make predictions about who's going to commit crime, crime in future, where crime is going to be committed in future. Um, and they use everything from very basic data analysis to more advanced algorithms. Um, uh, and sometimes it's referred to as artificial intelligence. It's a grand and fancy term that more often than not means um, a form of uh, advanced algorithm. And what they're ultimately doing is, yes, using historical data, information from the past to make predictions about the future. Um, and this is all based on the idea that if you have information about people, um, uh, about how people from specific social groups or from certain backgrounds, how they behave, you can predict how people from, how an individual from that group uh, or with a similar background may behave in future. And they use this information to determine um, whether someone's likely to commit crime in future for the purposes of policing decisions to decide who to put under surveillance, who to monitor, who to stop and search, who to question, um, and, and even sometimes who to arrest. Once you've been arrested, whether uh, they should, that individual should be prosecuted. Um, these predictions, these profiles, sometimes they're called risk assessments. What they're doing is they're, they're assessing the risk that you might be likely to commit crime in future. Um, and they're doing that based on often very basic information about you as a person, um, uh, often extremely prejudicial stereotypes based about people and their backgrounds. Um, you know, for example, they, want, they will look at uh, whether someone is from a single parent family, whether they have an immigrant background, whether one of their parents was in receipt of welfare or child benefits, whether the individual was themselves a victim of crime, whether they have alleged to have associations with other people who are known to the police, if they themselves are known to the police, whether how many times they've been stopped and searched, um, if they've been arrested previously, even if they've not been charged with anything. Um, and if any of those things sound uncomfortable, um, that's right, because that's exactly the kind of information that the police and other criminal justice authorities are using to make these predictions. It's the same prejudices, stereotypes and, and racism that we know that has a long and violent history. But this is now being played out in a new frontier. It's being played out in this the, 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 the data frontier. Um, and increasingly, police are using this kind of you know, advanced data analysis to inform and influence their, uh, their decisions. Um, so as I said, you know, to, to decide who to put under surveillance, who to stop and search, arrest, and also these other criminal justice decisions, um, prosecution, pre-trial detention, and even sentencing and probation decisions. Um, so for example, in the Netherlands, and this is drawing on our research that we did uh, over the last year and a half um, and, and published last year, um, into the use of these systems in Europe. An example in the Netherlands, police worked with social services to profile young men uh, as to whether they're likely to commit crime or not in the future. And this was based on whether they had previously been monitored by police. So if they had previously had contact with the police, that would uh, inform their risk, um, even if they hadn't been arrested. Um, uh, it included whether they'd been arrested, even if they hadn't been charged or convicted, whether even that they'd been in care, whether they'd been absent from school, if they'd changed school, uh, whether they'd been a domestic, uh, victim of domestic violence. These were all factors you know, that were used to, to determine whether someone's likely to commit a crime in future. Um, 
in the UK, uh, uh, another system, predictive system, was used to profile people to decide whether people should uh, be prosecuted or not. And it was using credit scores to inform these profiles and predictions. Um, across Europe, uh, and we had examples in our report from Germany, from Italy, the Netherlands, the UK, um, police use systems to predict where crime will take place, um, often using, yeah, using police data and sometimes even uncorroborated police intelligence or crime reports. So using that as the basis, um, it may be no surprise to you that one of the major issues with these systems is how they replicate bias, racism, and other institutional and structural prejudices. Um, so uh, as many of you will be aware, you know, police in, in uh, European countries um, and criminal justice systems in European countries um, and in countries around the world, they target racialized, marginalized groups. In Europe, black people, Roma, people in poverty are, are, are massively overrepresented um, in those who are policed and who are subject to criminal justice processes. Um, and so as a result of that, they are heavily overrepresented in the data, in the information which police are using as part of these predictive systems. Um, and this is that's the data that's used to uh, populate these systems upon which these systems make these predictions. So unsurprisingly, the outcomes from these systems are as racist and in other ways biased as the police and criminal justice authorities that use them. Um, the example I gave of the system used in the Netherlands, um, one third of the young men on it were of Dutch Moroccan heritage. And that these kinds of um, discriminatory over representations in the profiles on these systems are replicated time and time and time again in, the, in these systems. Um, Another element that is, is really problematic, as I mentioned, is it's not only this criminal justice data that is a problem, but it's also other, other non-criminal justice data, um, which also contains these over-representations um, or where these kind of correlations are drawn between non-criminal sort of criminal factors, for example, like poverty or deprivation, and correlations are drawn between that deprivation or poverty and criminality. Um, which is another layer which deepens and kind of hardwires that discrimination. So it's not just in terms of race or ethnicity, but also nationality or socioeconomic class. Um, for example, uh, a way in which this kind of seemingly legitimate data can act as a proxy for other factors like race or ethnicity is the use of home addresses or area codes. Um, and these predictive systems draw links between area codes and, and risks of, of reoffending. Um, and they're able to do that because in many European countries, there's, there's quite pronounced ethnic segregation, um, um, making it highly probable in practice for these systems to kind of inadvertently establish a link between uh, someone's ethnicity and, and, and where they live. Um, for example, uh, Roma are particularly vulnerable to this form of proxy discrimination, given that in many EU member states, uh, Roma are reported to, well, Roma live primarily in, in often very segregated areas. For example, in Sweden, migrants from non-European countries um, uh, are also often uh, living in highly segregated areas. So many forms of this data also act as, as this kind of proxy. Um, and uh, I'll just finish by saying that, you know, as I hope is clear, the fact that these systems are having uh, such an influence or having any influence at all, in fact, on criminal justice decisions, whether that is kind of surveillance and, and who, who are policed, to who gets arrested, who gets prosecuted, how long people get sentenced for, and, um, and how long they're then held. You know, these are very serious, life-changing decisions. Um, you know, they, uh, I don't think I need to go into how life-changing these kinds of decisions are, whether it's on a young person or on uh, someone who's older. It's more often than not, we're seeing these systems targeted at young people in a kind of bizarre attempt to help often, um, in the Netherlands, there was this use of phrasing of a careful use of care and punishment, which is extremely messed up that you're trying to, you know, punish as a form of care. Um, and that's something which I think, you know, gets touched upon in this, in this conception of, of policing and how it's often seen as um, uh, some, form of, some form of help. Um, but ultimately what's happening in these systems, in, in the way that these decisions are now being in, influenced by these systems and predictions, is the hardwiring of existing discrimination uh, and racism in, in criminal justice.
Um, and I think there's more to be said on, on solutions for this that we'll touch upon later, but that's the kind of short overview. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Griff. Um, and I think you have a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, that was extremely comprehensive and I feel like I learned a lot, so thank you. Um, and I would like to move on to Chloe um, and build on what Griff has just presented, because um, it seems from reading you um, that although there are this incredible, this, there's this incredible discriminatory potential to these technologies, to data-driven policing. It's very much making its way forward in Europe. Um, and not only that, but the European Union via Europol and other agencies is contributing to its consolidation and legalization. Um, so can you, can you talk a bit about that and what the, what that means for the rule of law fundamental rights and you know us general people who are hearing about this are like oh my god what can we i might use sometimes later on in the discussion to talk about solution uh but for now i want to give a brief overview uh of um what the role of the eu is in this data driven policing model and what I can say already is that the, the EU is playing an increasingly strategic role in the repressive political agenda of member states. Um, there is a clear continuity between the challenge and pro problems we face at national and local levels, like discriminatory policing that was touched upon by um, the other panelists, um, mass surveillance met methods as well, and the debates we observe at a uh, European level. And so the issues um, on the ground um, influence actually um, the police and justice cooperation instruments that are designed at EU level and vice versa. Um, so there is like an influence loop and feedback loop here. Um, and so what does the EU mainly does for member states security policies is mainly legitimizing data collection and exchange practices by a among law enforcement authorities, um, it basically gives them legal footing, um, legalizing practices, and it's also giving them concrete tools, channels of data exchange of cooperation at EU level. And here I want to mention three things, and that will complete actually the intervention of previous speakers. I want to say that the, I want to show you how the EU is helping member states to circumvent their own national li um, imitation, sorry, laws. Um, I want to show you how the EU is increasingly a law enforcement force in itself on its own, uh, gaining more and more powers. And then lastly, I want to show you how maybe like bring, like completing what Griff has explained on predictive policing, how the EU is contributing to making predictive policing uh, like the new norm in, in policing in general in Europe. And so, First, on this issue of circumvention of national laws, um, the EU is, is, is often used by member states as some sort of um, venue, uh, vehicle for forum shopping. Uh, what we call forum shopping is just um, the interest of certain policymakers to use different type of or different levels of government to pass uh, or adopt laws that would otherwise meet uh, resistance. For example, I give you one example from Way back then, it starts to be old, but like in the, 20, in the 2000s, um, the UK met some uh, political resistance uh, in their parliaments at national level to introduce a national scheme for mass retention of data of everybody, basically. Um, and uh, because they faced this resistance, they decided to go to the EU level and propose um, a, a new European directive for data retention. Um, which we considered as digital rights activist um, mass surveillance uh, law. And so they, uh, they basically upgraded, uploaded their own policy at EU level. And because this is the EU level, they were way less resistance and they could um, then come back to their parliament and say, see, the EU has said we have to do this. Um, and therefore, uh, this is what's going to happen. Um, so the EU is used to really legalize certain discriminatory policy practices that would I think have more scrutiny at national level than it does at EU level. Um, same for mass surveillance methods. 
Um, it's also used as a forum shopping avenue in terms of real, like in the course of real operations, like investigation, um, joint investigation uh, among law enforcement uh, agency in Europe. And no notably, obviously, you mentioned it through the role of Europol. Um, the goal now is to, what we've seen over the past years and observing the recent operation, we saw that um, the, the, the strategy is to pick the member state with the least restrictive rules at national level, um, laws, national laws that um, enable, allow law enforcement to do intrusive investigative measures, such as bulk hacking of communication. Um, and then once the information is obtained that this member states, it is then shared um, with all the other member states through Europol as a channel of data exchange. And even through Europol's own analysis, actually, like Europol is more and more taking the role of doing this data mining um, uh, function. Um, and so we, we see Europol more and more becoming what we call a data laundering machine. It's like gathering data from a source, an origin, where usually the member state wouldn't have access, like the, the authorities wouldn't have access to this data, but since it's, it went through this channel of communication, suddenly there is no questions to be raised anymore about their origin of the data and how it is used. Um, and this is what is problematic in terms of the rule of law, obviously, because you're circumventing very important um, uh, safeguards at national level in national law, but also constitutional protections, obviously. And obviously it's a problem of fair trial uh, rights because the origin of the data that you found uh, in court cases uh, cannot be put into questions. You don't know where it's coming from. And so it's, it's a problem for defense lawyers and judges um, to actually have to make decisions and their job, it makes their job way more difficult. Um, on the law enforce, on the EU becoming its own law enforcement force, I want to mention the fact that I think the most exemplary thing is the creation of EPO, so the European Public Prosecutor Office, which has its own role in investigating, prosecuting, bringing to judgment uh, crimes affecting the financial interest of the EU. But also, obviously, um, Europol and Frontex, um, so the agencies of the European Union. Um, they're getting way more powers over the years um, along the course of the revision of their own uh, mandate. They are becoming more autonomous in what they're doing. So initially when they were created, those agencies were completely depending on national law enforcement and or even national border management uh, agencies. Um, more and more they get their own staff, they get their own budget, they get their own function, and they can decide to initiate action when they want or not. Um, and so, for example, um, the reform of Europol, which is ongoing currently at, at EU level and will be soon voted upon, gives the agency the power to request data directly uh, from a large range of private actors, including online platforms, telecom companies, uh, banks, uh, financial in institution, international organization, and so forth and so on. Before it was not possible at all. And even now it is restricted to specific cases. Um, it is a first foot in the doorstep for Europol in the future reform to be able to actually uh, investigate about someone, request data about a certain person. Um, so it's extremely problematic for fundamental rights in, from that perspective and from the rule of law, because in the treaties, Europol doesn't have any executive powers. Um, so we don't have built at the EU system the same kind of oversight mechanism you see at national level um, that ensures that the check and balance system is functioning um, well. And, and we, can we can completely agree, actually, about how it is highly dysfunctioning, actually, at national level. Um, but at EU level, we work with nothing, nada, zero. We have no judicial oversight or like barely um, and we have very weak oversight mechanism in place. They're not really like independent, um, if you ask my opinion. So there is no kind of even the span, the spanner is not even existing to put in the works, so to say. Um, and so this is something that is taken more and more advantage of. Um, there's more cooperation agreements uh, being concluded between EU agencies to exchange data, to collect data on behalf of each other. 
you can look at the um, agreements between um, Frontex and Europol that evolved um, along like throughout the 2010s um, with a wider set of information exchanged across the years or even like joint operation where Frontex and Europol on both on the ground um, collecting data. Um, that was the case, for example, um, since uh, 2016, Europol was reported to have screened migrants in camps in Italy and in Greece, amassing data from tens of thousands of asylum seekers um, alongside Frontex. And so Frontex is supposed to have um, data collected and also sent to Europol, and actually increasingly vice versa, Europol is helping Frontex uh, missions. Uh, lastly, on profiling, uh, I really like the fact that Griff explained all the details of how it works, um, so I don't have to do it, but basically um, the EU is really contributing to that. Um, and we as Edri have described how the new Europol reform is enabling a sort of NSA style surveillance operation, um, which means the massive collection of data about Europol and then the use of data mining to find out who is problematic who has potentially committed a crime or will likely commit a crime in the future. But the EU has already engaged way before Europol reform on uh, supporting profiling practices by EU member states. And that started in the counterterrorism field. And this is no surprise, I think, to Nura to know about this. But like the EU started with like anti-money laundering uh, directive and the counterterrorism directive, obviously which oblige private actors such as bank, auditors, notaries to report suspicion, uh, suspicious transactions that may be linked to money laundering or to terrorism financing. Um, and the way they do that um, is to oblige to have risk assessment procedure, as Griff explained. And obviously the problem we see for fundamental rights is how do you define the criteria to define who is potentially risky uh, what, is a, what is a risky transaction, basically? And what you see at the end of the process is that there is an over-representation uh, of among the individuals that are matching the risky profile uh, to be um, migrants, asylum seekers, and uh, cross-border uh, work workers, because those are people who have an interest in sending money abroad uh, back to their home countries. Um, and this is not the end of it. Um, there is also EU database that supports uh, more and more um, predictive policing. I think I'm running out of time, so I will leave it for later. <laughs> um, and there's so much to say. I mean, the entire EU security agenda has boomed in the last year, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chloe. And yes, I feel like we could all talk endlessly about this. Um, hence why we're going to keep all of us here um, and have a conversation um, touching on the points that you've all raised that I think paint a very clear and frightening picture. Um, and just to, to start it off, but please feel free to, to unmute yourself when you feel like it and just jump in, like, let's make this a bit informal. Um, and I'll encourage, again, um, people attending to write questions down and we'll, we'll take a second to look at, at those too. Um, one thing that I've been thinking uh, while you were all talking is this, this overarching um, theme of data um, and how, on the one hand, uh, we are increasingly being met with there's no data or we cannot collect data or colorblindness in Europe that reinforced the denial um, of policymakers um, and beyond. Um, on the other hand, uh, no, on the same hand, actually, um, evidence, uh, Ojako was talking about stories that come up, it's, it's nearly impossible um, not to see actual stories of suffering and there's a whole discussion around that too, but um, it's very hard to not know that this is happening and there's a, there's something to be said about what we believe as data and what we consider as, as evidence um, of racism, of structural racism in policing in the criminal legal systems uh, more widely. On the other hand, um, this data somehow comes up and makes the basis for programs that are inc incredibly racist. 
So I, I just wanted to throw the word data out there uh, and see if you had thoughts, comments, and um, um, if, you wanna, if you wanna talk about community experiences and beyond, please. Not all at the same time. I mean, I can maybe go first. Yes, please. Um, I mean, I think it is a complicated discussion to have around data um, because as we've heard by, heard from our previous speakers, but it's kind of a, like data collection and, and use of it by law enforcement and the exchange sharing, all of this is problematic, but at the same time, organizations like INAR um, are calling for equality data collection, but it's different. Um, it's not the same. Um, equality data collection, which is what we advocate for, is, is to have data that allows us to see um, to what extent there are racial, there is racial discrimination in, from institutions, um, and how we can address it, what policies could work, what policies don't work. <clears throat> and I think that um, it's very interesting um, that governments will decide not to collect some data and collect others. Um, and it's a very political, it's a very political decision that they make. Um, and we know that the police or police institutions do collect a huge amount of data that, that that can give us the information as community, like people who are working within communities or community organizers or advocates of some sort that could help us identify some of the racist uh, policing. And they collect this data, but they keep it for themselves and maybe they deny that they even have it. Um, and I think we saw that in, in, in France, especially during COVID that the, there was a, a huge amount of data collected and you could start to see how they were targeting certain areas that um, had um, more, um, you know, post-colonial migrants or more diverse communities. Um, and then there was like, you know, freedom of, like freedom of information or request for that information from the police and from government institutions so that, so that um, communities could understand what was happening and have the evidence. So yeah, it, it's, data is, is, a, is a complex issue. Um, on the one hand, we do want it, but there are very particular like frameworks or dimensions for how to have and uh, like collect data that doesn't infringe on our fundamental rights. Um, and I guess that um, the, it would be quite easy to, to make that distinction if governments wanted to. But I will, I will leave it there and let other colleagues jump in. Absolutely. That's what I was looking for in terms of an answer. Um, but also I, I wanted to ask Noura maybe to, to um, I know we talked about uh, community resistance, community stories, um, how important those are in, in shaping narratives, um, but also how governments are trying to restrain um, the efforts of reaching communities of civil society, shrinking space of Muslim civil society, uh, working with these communities. So can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, again, um, maybe to start with Austria, because yeah, like um, as I mentioned before, the past year was very dramatic for us in Austria. Also when it comes to that, so when it comes to um, resistance from the target community, because what the Austrian government was basically doing is that there's complete lack of transparency. Um, and I'm saying that, for, for example, when it comes to the Anti-Terror Act, um, it was um, in May when there was the press conference where it was that first the Anti-Terror Act was introduced or proposed a few days after the attack on 2nd November. Then um, it was revised and then newly introduced via press conference in May. There was a complete lack of transparency. The critics from the civil society um, was not implemented at all. Even though the critics, when it comes to that, um, they were very um, they were very present. 
Um, the government didn't care at all. There was a complete lack of transparency. Um, they introduced it during a pandemic um, very spontaneously, um, complete lack of transparency. And, um, and, and now it has been passed a few months ago, the Anti-Terror Act, which includes also for the first time in Austria's history that an, um, a religious law was passed without the approval of the religious community. Um, all, and all the political party members approved of that as well. So um, that's why I think, especially when it comes to, um, you know, looking at the pandemic and all the measures which, are, which have been, you know, taking place at the target community, it's very, it's very dramatic in Austria. And all the shrinking, um, the shrinking space for the, uh, for the civil society and the target community. And also with going back to Operation Luxor, because who was targeted at Operation Luxor, basically our key activists or um, charity organizations um, from ranging from um, Palestine, um, humanitarian aid, um, our you know scholars, our imams, all of them have been targeted, which were basically the the you know key members of our communities, you know doing their resistance. <laughs> um, yeah, to start with that, um, do you have any more, you know, specific questions when it comes to, um, you know, civil society resistance of the target community or something? Um, no, I was just thinking of um, everything that's been happening in Austria, in France. Uh, I'm not sure those are the only examples, um, but in a way that um, basically shrunk the space for civil society. And what that also means in terms of oversight and accountability, because I feel like we've been talking about where where could we turn or what what are we're a bit building on on the solutions, mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the key aspects: the fact that civil society does not have a space, and, and not even that is just um, completely criminalized in many in many places. Exactly, like it's it's criminalized, but also when it comes back to the police, right? So basically in Austria, we don't have a monitoring um, office for the police. So if you want to complain about the police, you go to the police to complain about the police. So this doesn't already look very good for us here in Austria. <laughs> um, uh, so <laughs> yeah, that's also one thing. But when it comes to accountability, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, we also like from the um, Muslim response uh, initiative we founded a few days or you know shortly after Operation Luxor called ACTP, assist assisting uh, communities traumatized by police. Um, one thing we have been repeatedly, um, especially over the past half a year or something said is that the state persecutor basically is a very well known race racist. Um, still he's handling the cases, no, not all allegations have been dropped, so this is the circle we are in right so um, we are very well aware that the court right now is on our side, but we see that it can be very different when we look at France, where the court is backing up um, the government and power. Here in Austria, we deserve the privilege right now that the court is um, is for us, but um, we are not relying on you know white men to um, to to have this moral understanding of this can change any day which is why we um, have this focus on empowering the target community to tell their stories and to, um, to stand up for themselves, basically. Um, especially when we look at France right now, because, and we have talked about it, um, you know, individually. I think we have, as, as a world consciousness, not really processed how bad it is in France, that there's literally a persecution going on. France is not even, um, approving that there's a religious minority, right? They're not even approving of, of that, right? And all the anti-separatism -separat law, systemic obstruction policy, um, which is literally a persecution of Muslims. Um, I mean, Austria is very much following the footsteps of France right now. And we see that also on the transnational level that this, you know, they're coming together and doing something, which is why I embrace, you know, these conferences as well, where we are coming together as well and um, see also what we can actually do about that, um, especially for the target community. But yeah, this is, you know, uh, and I mean, when it comes to the shrinking uh, civil um, society space, obviously this pandemic was amplifying that as well. 
Also, when we had demonstrations here going on, 80 people showed up against the Anti-Terror Act. So we, we are very restricted in our movements as well, obviously, during the lockdown. And let's remember that Operation Luxor and, um, and um, Anti-Terror Act was introduced during the lockdown. And the police noted that. Like, if you look at the po into the police documents, they literally said that there's no, there was no resistance from civil society and from the target community. Because they were even surprised <laughs> how dead it is here in Austria, <laughs> that literally nobody was doing something. So, um, so on the one hand, we have a very bad situation in France, where at least there's some awareness, even though we don't really have processed how bad it is. And in Austria, I feel like um, nobody's really paying that much attention to it anyways. And this is when you look at counter extremism, there's hardly, there, there's not much research on it. Um, so I think especially in this circle, um, it would be good, to, you know, just to start to spreading awareness and uh, to do something and to start documenting and do whatever, you know, the expertise you have in to um, to to do something about it. If it's you know the, the documentation center against political Islam and calling for the abolishment of that, is it you know um, coming to the surveillance of it? You know because um, here in Austria the Muslim civil society or community um, exclusively is um, is exposed to um, the security apparatus, like no other religious community. No other religious community is exposed to this kind of working together with um, um, security intelligence where our members have to meet up um, with them to basically prove you know, that everything is you know, all right. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, this, this is from my side, what I hope for also from this panel. <laughs> You know that there's a lot of hope also in what you're saying and I really appreciate that and we really appreciate having you here and having these discussions I am a firm believer that we need to be having these discussions um, between movements much more often um, so very grateful that you're all here and I think one thing that you said um, that is really interesting is is really it comes back to what structural or systemic racism and bias really is the fact that um, you impacted communities by injustice cannot rely on the fact that today the courts in Austria, for instance, are um, denouncing Operation Luxor and the, the racist prosecutions, um, because there has been such a history of injustice that you never know uh, whether the courts tomorrow will, will react the same way, uh, whether laws will change, and then courts will uphold laws that are, are completely different. Um, so I think it's really important to remember when we're talking about these issues that we are talking about the structural and the systemic, and this is such a pervasive, um, a pervasive issue. Um, and I think it's, um, um, yeah, sh sorry, Chloe, please um, log back in. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, just saw your message. Um, um, and, and that, of course, um, plays into oversight, accountability, oversight by whom, accountability to whom. Um, and I don't know, Griff, if if you wanna if you wanna take this one. I see that also in the chat, someone's asking, how do we get in a position where there's no checks and balances? I don't know if you have if you have thoughts on this. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so like bring together a few things that have been said. Um, I think first of all, there is, um, as, as Nora was saying, you know, there is a very, it, it's vital to document these rights violations. There's, there's a need to highlight um, what's going on, whether that's the targeting of, of, of Muslims in Austria um, or targeting of, of racialized and um, marginalized groups in uh, many different ways across Europe. Um, you know, these experiences are not a monolith. They don't happen in the same way to everyone. Um, and it's vital to, to document what's going on and not just in terms of the, the, the kind of the broader data, because the statistics, that information that only tells one side of the story, just as important, sometimes more important is the individual, the human stories. Um, you know, each person has their own experience of injustice, racism and sexism at the hands of authorities and documenting what's happening, um, documenting those stories. That's part of, I think, of seeking accountability, but it's only a first step because states have denied this kinds of structural prejudice for years. Even now, 
um, you know, states, they, they talk about police racism or, or sexism or Islamophobia, even when, you know, and there'd been some particularly stark examples recently in the UK in terms of police sexism. Um, but the, the authorities, they talk about them as individual cases or even individual forces. Um, and it should be hard to deny when there's clear information, you know, when, when you've got the receipts, when you've got that, that information, like, and they've been caught red handed, um, you know, data on, you know, particular groups being targeted um, again and again and again. Um, in some European countries, that information is certainly lacking and it does allow the states to say that there's no problem. Um, you know, because that information isn't comprehensive. Um, but we do also have to be aware that, that, that some, that in many countries where that data is comprehensive, like in the US or the UK, it hasn't yet had a huge impact on those structural issues. So I don't want to downplay it. I think it is absolutely vital. It is, is an element of, of kind of seeking that accountability, having that information, but it's not a solution in and of itself. It's only the first step to addressing that structural problem. Um, and... To, to touch on what was being said about kind of expanding that net, expanding the net of criminalization, um, just from my point of view on, on the way that new technologies and these systems are also con contributing to that. Um, it's no longer just that you have been caught or that it's been alleged that you've done a certain act and you've been unlucky enough to be targeted by the police in relation to that act, but it's now people who haven't even yet committed the act but it's been it's being predicted that they will be um, so you know historic notions of suspicion of criminality um, historic notions of otherness um, they're now being reified replayed out in in these new technologies and this type of constant suspicion um, this constant surveillance um, it, it, it is it is itself a kind of form of imprisonment um, it's a prison of suspicion um, you're a targeted group you know, you just don't know any 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 kind of um, representation of authority, whether police, criminal justice authorities, you know, they could be like that agent of um, of suspicion. Um, and if you are a targeted group, sometimes there almost is no way out. That net is being expanded wider and wider using these new technologies and people are being caught up, uh, caught up within it. Um, and I mean, in terms of to again, just to go back to accountability um i think there's a difference between accountability and justice and, and many great thinkers have kind of said this and I'm, I'm very much drawing on that but um there's justice and there's accountability and they're two separate things and justice is taking action to to kind of address uh the the wrongs that have been caused uh, accountability is just is the first step of trying to get people to take responsibility and often we people have we are those people have a hard enough job just getting accountability from those people in power to get people, uh, the police, criminal justice authorities, governments to admit wrongdoing, to get the system to admit that wrongdoing. Um, and so much energy and emotion and time and, uh, is expended on just getting that accountability that people don't, you know, don't even necessarily get to that step of seeking justice, that much more systemic outcome. Um, and then true justice is, and is more, it's about more than just a single verdict in a trial in a in a in a single trial it's about um it's about you know that systemic change that, that systemic justice so it's absolutely right to talk about accountability to talk about oversight but i think that's only you know those are the first steps in getting to where we and 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 many others want to be uh want to be in that i feel like i might have jumped the gun in terms of pushing us into that area but um uh, i felt like i might as well say it while i was on the topic uh, can I maybe add something in there? Um, also, when it comes to uh, accountability, I think, and justice, solidarity is very important um, because more often than not, these target individuals or communities, what they experience is that there's a complete lack of solidarity, even from N NGOs who claim to fulfill a man like this mandate to actually step in and show solidarity. So I think um, also for our community or the bubble we are in, it's very important to understand that um, there's like a mandate we have to fulfill. And in this sense to show, um, you know, the basic rules of solidarity for, this, um, for these individuals. And um, to do, you know, the work in our remit um, to, to, to show, you know, this solidarity in our 
you know, in our case or in the initiative we founded, we, you know, we organize events and uh, we try to push back against this defamation claim, like claims or attempts of the government and put uh, these um, targeted individuals um, on stage and to tell the stories and empower them. But um, I'm sure like every specific NGO with their specific, you know, expertise, they can do something to show um, solidarity in their own, um, in their own context, if that makes sense. Especially because there is a lack when it comes to just, you know, strong solidarity. <laughs> so if you target the um, target individuals or communities, they will very often tell you that they felt completely alone, even though there are so many NGOs who work in this um, in this field, right? Just to add something in there. Um, those are both incredibly important interventions and thank you for that and I think maybe let's move in that direction um because I also see the the time passing um so I I don't want to ask you for solutions necessarily but I want to ask your thoughts on um how we move forward or access for change given everything um, that we've been hearing in this panel, um, for instance, accountability versus justice, for instance, lack of political will that is actually underpinning inaction um, and no amount of laws, uh, accountability bodies, oversight uh, organisms will actually amount to a change in practice. It's just more bureaucracy, more, um, more to dismantle down the line. Um, in a way, uh, I also see a question in the chat from um, Claim Alliance. I think I lost it about um, Europol and how instead of, wouldn't it be more productive to advocate for divesting and defunding Europol than for an independent oversight body? And I think that doesn't just apply to Europol. Um, I know, Ojaku, in, in your report, you're talking about redefining rather than reforming um, what reform amounts to um, versus is it time to reimagine, title of this conference. Um, maybe, maybe each of you can, can take a, turn, a turn and a turn and talk about the way forward, if possible. I don't want to call out on you anymore. Chloe? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected that I'm put forward on this question first. Um, I think there are other speakers in the room who are much more advanced uh, reflection on this question than we do at EDRI. And uh, I must be very frank here. I think we are at the, the first steps of this process to redefine the system to re reimagining uh, it rather than trying to reform because if I be totally honest Edry's kind of mission is to try to draft for policy change and when we are faced with new legislation at EU level it's so hard to turn the wheel in the opposite direction uh, you have to work with what you get um, and this is usually really really bad um, so trying to be like constructive in a debate that where all the terms have already been set way before and it's almost impossible to drive policymakers in a completely diff different direction, it's end up in um, just in a pure simple opposition. It's like we disagree completely with what you think um, and it's really hard to pass that point uh, and to engage in a constructive debate about could you imagine a different system in which Frontex wouldn't like contribute to illegal pushbacks, for example? No, <laughs> Frontex is defending our people, our way of living. Um, da -da -da. So it's it's a it's a very difficult um, enterprise to get onto because it is underpinned by a security narrative that in itself is super hard to stop and to contradict. And so when it's like translated into legislative text, then it adds a burden, like a layer of opacity, because like there we are losing people. 
as soon as you're talking about legislation at EU, European level, um, for NGOs working at national and local level, it becomes so hard to understand the process or to get engaged in this. So you, you have this additional layer of complexity in how we engage on those issues. Um, as soon as it turns, uh, member state turns to the EU to share harmonized security policies. Um, so all of this uh, makes it very difficult to <laughs> engage in this, uh, in this mission of let's rethink. And I would, I would love to imagine a day where I don't know, hashtag abolish Europol is trending on Twitter, um, but that will actually take some years actually to build the momentum, to build the coalition. Um, and to, to what you're I, I would love to gather forces around this, this objective, but first of all, the, the problem with C4, like I'm taking Europol because this is my main kind of, <laughs> my obsession of the last month and what I'm, I'm mostly uh, competent in, but um, I guess it, it can be applied to other um, policy areas, but we are already struggled to see the impact of EU action sometimes on concrete cases. So even like coming back to your question about data collection before, that is something that is missing. And this is certainly not something we can expect from institutions to fulfill. Like the gap is there and they have no interest whatsoever. You're, you're talking about ideology and lack of political will. This is clearly where you see what Ojaku was saying, like they're collecting data where they want and they stop collecting when it starts to put into questions um, the necessity and the proportionality of their actions and their policies. So already this is the first step to, to make um, and try to exchange information between um, uh, each other because I know some people hold information uh, and I we hold up information uh, with our action at, at EU level and all of this could create a good, already good resistance um, to ongoing processes, but yeah. Opening up the window to something completely different. I'm looking forward to it. I'm just uh, give me time and resources. <laughs> it's basically my 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 message. No, but that's that's exactly it. I think Chloe, this is the dot on the eye. Is that a dot on the eye? Is that something that means something to people? Does everyone understand what I mean by that? I think so. I'm just gonna continue as if everyone got what I want to say. Um, because so we need to work with the system too or do we um it, it's really complicated to find a line on which when you realize that the system is only going to give crumbs and as you said is only going to do as much as it enables it to remain in power to 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 keep building on those systems of oppression that we keep calling out that they're going to budge. But at the end of the day, we also see very radical voices being silenced quite violently, as Nura was exposing. So there's always this, do we need to thread the line between um, short-term action, long-term action, working with the system, divesting from the system gradually? Is that even possible? Um, what's the pace? And where do we put the resources and who is giving us these resources? And I know these are 200 other questions. Um, I, I don't know if anyone wants to, to pick up. Um, can I maybe add something? Absolutely. Also to uh, Chloe and what you just said. I mean, I feel like I've already talked a little bit about it before, before you actually started to ask this question and what we as an you know, NGO bubble, you know, or this kind of bubble can actually do. But I think um, actually education is very key. Also when it comes to not, not actually using the government's narrative because more often than not, um, what happens is that maybe intentional or not intentional um, NGOs, activists just basically um, make use of the government's narrative. So what we have, act for example, when it comes to the Anti-Terror Act, just to give you a very brief example, of what I mean when I'm saying that is you can very easily find um, NGOs, um, many NGOs criticizing parts of the Anti-Terror Act, but they actually use um, 
this narrative that this fake science of you know um, extremism leads, leads to terrorism, and this creates um, you know the legitimation of a belief crime. But what they do is that they criticize certain parts of it, but never abolish the whole the whole thing and say, hey, this is actually a complete fake science coming from a power, and it's a political move in the first place, and we don't you know on any way replicate or reproduce this narrative. So I think when it comes to, you know, no matter which uh, circle, also civil society, um, you know, what the government is doing and media is, and that's just how it is. And it's so funny because um, literally our chancellor had to resign because he was manipulating public opinion via media. Um, is uh, the media is acting here as a speakerphone of this, of this kind of narrative. So I think one of the first steps of, um, thinking outside of the system is to start not using the language of the system or the language of the power or the language of the government. Um, and because if you do that deep down, <laughs> you, you, actually <laughs> you actually think that Muslims are second class citizens and should be get a special treatment, but maybe a little bit of a nicer, you know, <laughs> nice, nicer one, but um, you basically reproduce the system. So I feel like education in our bubble, but also outside of the bubble in the civil society, um, especially in a time where the government is, you know, repeatedly sending out a message is, is very important. Um, yeah, just to, just to give, you know, one example. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Nora. Um, I think Griff had a hand up first. Hey, yeah, thank you. Um... Well, I think that um, we shouldn't be afraid to seek imaginative and, and ambitious solutions. Um, and that should include you know, questioning whether the systems we have in place and the institutions that we have in place operating those systems, are they, are they right for us? You know, it's up to us as a society to decide whether they're right for us. You know, police, prosecutors, judges, judicial authorities, you know, international bodies like Europol, um, you know, and, and the, the solutions that, that we know about, you know, the solutions that we've seen in some places, you know, are these changes, we want to, we should be ambitious and imaginative to, to, to think, I mean, are they reducing the influence of these institutions and these systems on people's lives? Do they keep people free from the disproportionate, violent, discriminatory use of criminal powers, of these institutions' powers? Um, I think, you know, these are these are ideas and concepts that have, you know, existed historically for some time, but I think the pandemic has been a, um, it's been a moment for people to realize that only really radical and progressive solutions will solve some of these significant structural and institutional issues in criminal justice and in, and in wider society, of course. Um, you know, men, many, of, many of the issues in criminal justice are, are a reflective of or a direct result of wider issues within society. Um, racism, sexism, sexism, Islamophobia, um, other forms of discrimination, poverty. Um, and we do those issues true justice when we take up, um, you know, positions or seek solutions which properly tackle those problems. In the criminal justice context, you know, that's things like decriminalization, decarceration, you know, reducing the number of people um, in prisons, reducing the number of people um, you know, subject to the criminal law um, and other reductions of, of, of law enforcement and criminal justice power. Um, I think, I think the, the, the reforms and changes that we call for, um, they should seek to reduce the power, the influence and the control um, in both literal and material financial terms, um, that power, influence and control of police and criminal justice authorities in our lives, rather than reforms which ultimately perpetuate and maintain those systems, um, those structures, you know, for example, reforms which perpetuate the status quo are, you know, seeking more police, seeking more training of police or prosecutors or judges, um, more oversight mechanisms that have no real bite, um, you know, even more hate crime laws, which, you know, is, is sometimes controversial, but is ultimately, again, um, often used, they're often used against the very communities which they are allegedly supposed to protect. Um, in the specific context that I spoke of earlier, in the context of predictive profiling algorithms and AI systems, 
um, fair trials and, and many other organizations are, we're working towards a ban on the use of those systems in policing and criminal justice in Europe um, due to what I spoke about, the, the discrimination, the undermining of the right to the presumption of innocence. And I just don't think, we don't think that, you know, more oversight will not solve that issue. Um, just to, to touch on one of the, some of the questions earlier uh, in the chat, more transparency would be useful in that context. Um, you know, these algorithms are not often available for, for public perusal. Uh, their use is opaque. We don't know who's using them, uh, what, we, what they're used, used for, how they're used, uh, what information is used. Um, and that's, again, that's like one of the very early first steps because people don't know that they've been targeted by these predictive systems. Um, they don't know that, know that, you know, Europol holds data on them um, and they hold vast amounts of information. Um, people don't know that they've been profiled as criminal. So, um, and uh, whilst there often isn't kind of proper oversight in this area, um, I don't think that that would solve that problem. Um, we don't need more oversight. We need to address um, what those, uh, what it, whether countries, national countries or national police forces or other law enforcement or, you know, other criminal justice authorities, we need to address what they're doing directly rather than kind of having more, government-led or even police-led overview or institutions to kind of you know look at what they're up to we need these proper structural solutions to what are real structural uh, problems absolutely thank you griff and i just wanted to make one point on we've been using the word radical and i think a lot of time that scares people um, and I always try to make the point that for radical injustice, we need radical responses. And I think if there's one thing we learned from this panel today is how radical, how systemic, how structural um, injustice is. Uh, and if we are going to work to reverse that, um, we need to really mean it. Um, and now I'm going to give the floor to Ojaku. And I was thinking, Ojaku, if maybe you can also that I found this question very good in the chat. If we vote in politicians and the politicians are responsible for the laws and systems, then where have we gone wrong? Um, if, you, if you don't mind incorporating that in your answer, another challenge your way. OK, uh, I will try. Um, I wanted to say, really, to first of all, I completely agree with what Griff um, was saying. Um, many of his ideas and proposals of solutions and um, are correct from my, pers my perspective. I think we do need um, many approaches, like thinking about abolition, we need to think about that and what does that mean and what does that look like? We need to think about transformative justice. We need to think about divesting, defunding certain institutions, um, decriminalization, all of these things are really, kind of important and critical to addressing the problems that we see. We can't just tinker and reform certain aspects of policing um, to, that will result in, in, in more fairer practices. We've tried that over decades and decades and decades, and it's, it's not resulted in, in what we want. Um, I mean, things like increasing the diversity of the police, community policing, early warning systems for problem officers, um, developing standards, codes of ethics, training, body cams, civilian oversight bodies. All of these are reforms that we've seen um, proposed, introduced um, in, in many different places. And I'm not to, not to say that they have no good effects at all, but the, their effects are very limited. <clears throat> and you see that the, so we have to think of some alternative, maybe radical, maybe not so radical um, solutions. Um, and I think that I find working in a, an EU organization, I, I find that I can be quite, I become quite cynical now thinking about how to address these how to address these issues because Chloe is absolutely right. Um, there is such a, a kind of like, um, I don't know, there's such a, a kind of agenda that is so powerful that is um, taking us in a certain way. And then how do we kind of, how do we stop that? How do we slow it down? How do we turn it around? And it's very, very difficult, I think, at an EU, um, and at an EU level. And I think, um, one of the things that we must do is, I think everybody must do, is look back to the communities, go back to the communities and ask where we can, we can decide 
what does safety look like to us? What do we need our communities in, in order to live kind of like safe lives? And how do, we, how do we then kind of like allocate the budget accordingly? It becomes very difficult when you have this kind of like huge EU kind of um, agenda, um, but I still think that you have to go back to the local communities and that's where the decisions about budgets and how to divest from certain um, things needs to happen and how you can put more money in, in areas like mental health or um, I don't know, just services for the communities um, rather than policing communities. Um, so I think that really needs to happen. Um, and, I, and I see, I think from Nicoletta, there was a question about um, uh, the race equality directive. And yes, they are looking and hoping to extend the scope. And, and this, is, this is the difficulty, and this is where my, my, I become very cynical because, okay, we can, we can introduce more legislation to protect us, but we have a lot of legislation that is essentially supposed to protect us and we're still in this um, kind of difficult scenario. I don't think it's worth us saying one, like either or. I think we have to, to, to be a little bit pragmatic in, in understanding like what, what we would propose as like EU, and, like EU NGOs or, or NGOs working in this area. Like we have to be a bit pragmatic about what we can suggest. Um, and then have in mind that certain reforms don't help, um, but you know, we're on a long kind of, you know, discussions about abolition are, are, now, in, in, uh, are now being discussed at an EU kind of level. I think we have this organization called Abolish Frontex. Um, <laughs> but the, these things are happening and I suspect in the next five, five years, we will be in a position where we can, we can ask for more like specific change. And I don't know about this, uh, this question about uh, voting the politicians. Um, I don't think we've gone wrong. I think the politicians have gone wrong. <laughs> Um, they present to us a certain agenda and we, we don't have that much of a choice sometimes. Um, so I'm not sure I can really answer that question. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I really answered any questions. I just said a lot of things about lots of different solutions. <laughs> you answered many a question and you said the A word. So I'm extremely pleased. The A word being abolition. Uh, we're very afraid of using it for some reason in Europe. We're getting there. Um, just before I give you each 30 seconds to wrap up, just because I know I promised this. And also, I don't, I, if you have just this one brilliant thing you feel like you haven't said, I urge you to now. Um, just before that, um, to answer a question in the chat, if we defend what alternative solutions are there. Um, I will invite everyone attending um, to our Thursday panel on decriminalization, decarceration, alternatives to that. I think there are a lot of solutions out there. I think um, we are not talking a lot enough about them, and I think there's not enough spaces for reflection on it. But don't worry, there's we, no one knows more um, than others. I think we're all in this in this process of, of learning and of wanting to go beyond. Um, so Thursday, hopefully we can do that. So I invite everyone to this panel and also to plug in tomorrow's panel, which is called Europe's Carceral Fever. I'll go back to uh, Griff's point about the blurriness of the lines between inside prison and outside of prison when we know the reality of mass surveillance that essentially control entire neighborhoods, entire communities um, whose data is being known, who are, um, you know, just like processed as a presumption under a suspicion already, is that being free? Uh, and that's something we can discuss tomorrow uh, with other brilliant panelists. I hope you'll all also be there. Um, 30 seconds on the clock, Nora. Thanks. Uh, I actually was taking some notes. I'm happy I was like the first one. <laughs> so yeah, to, to start maybe, um, I think, you know, especially when it comes to solution, um, if, we, if we want to take a uh, very authentic approach, we go to the communities and groups who are on the receiving end of it because they are like, nobody will 
fight as hard for their rights as the ones who are on the receiving end of it, because this is not a nine to five job for them. <laughs> it goes also on after 5 p.m. for them. <laughs> so obviously, so if we want to have an authentic approach of solution, how we can think out of the system and how we can, you know, imagine a new um, a just uh, system, then we have to go to the ones um, who are um, who are on the directly receiving end of it and see how we can amplify their voices and um, and help them in whatever their needs they are, whether we are a legal NGO or an advocacy NGO or whatever NGO it is. But we have to communicate with the obviously directly impacted to see what needs they are so we don't end up just doing anything. <laughs> uh, so we have to build this connection. I, I wanted to uh, mention um, also before, and obviously with, ha with having that in mind, we have to be aware that it starts with this maybe vulnerable, more vulnerable groups, but it ends coming to everybody who is basically having, you know, um, an, you know not a, a political opinion the government doesn't uh, like, right? So we shouldn't think that it's not coming to us just because we're, for example, not Muslim or whatever it is but it ends up going to the whole society and um, to all the um, you know, opinions the government doesn't, uh, basically doesn't like. And in that sense, because you were also mentioning very brilliant, brilliantly before the term you know, of um, getting this stamp of radical and we shouldn't be af too much afraid of that because if we, and we are all agreed on that, like every single one of us is that we are living in a system which is deeply unjust, right? So if, if the very same people who are <laughs> building up this um, um, uh, injustice are calling us radical when we think outside of their injustice, it's probably a good sign. It would be you know, worse if they, <laughs> if they would applaud us um, for what we are doing. So in that sense, uh, you know, keeping in mind that we have, you know, we are living in a society where power is basically um, oppressing communities, being called radical, or um, being a threat to this unjust uh, system is a good sign and we should be happy about that um, and not the opposite. But obviously this is part of what I was mentioning before. I'm no, I know I, my 30 seconds are not really, but coming to an end, but that's why I'm, you know, was highlighting that we shouldn't reproduce um, one step of, you know, creating a new, you know, system or thinking outside of the system is really not to use the government's or power um, narrative and language on any kind. Because very often unintentional, it happens that, and you were talking about that before, Griff, um, you know, how we so often call up for certain reforms. And you, you mentioned before, like, or yeah, I think you mentioned before that um, sometimes they do have good impact, but the worst thing we can do is unintentional, just reproduce a system and legitimize this system. And this is what happens if we call for reform, because then we say we are okay with the whole thing. It's just some dust in it, which we don't like. And, and then Iona coming back to you when you talk about abolishment, you know, obviously this is abolishment, right? If you don't talk about some reforms, but if you th start like thinking outside of the box and outside of the system, and it starts with, you know, using the same language because what the system is doing is sending us a you know, specific narrative. Everybody un unintentionally even you know, believes in civil society. So this education of in our bubble and outside in civil society is very key to, um, to build you know, a new, um, more just society. And um, yeah, that's Absolutely. It. Thank you, Nora. Um, Chloe, 30 seconds, but like the real ones. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have a lot of things wise to say, but like if I want to use my 30 seconds well, I would say that I'm more than happy that this conversation is engaged on abolitionism. Um, we have, we need to invest time in, in finding these alternative views, in thinking about other solutions that actually tackle the problem and not uh, just play with the terms that were set by people with very different agendas. Um, and yeah, I just to, 
illustrate maybe the task that is in front of us. I just want to mention to end up with an anecdote. I was talking to a policymaker or somebody from the institutions on Europol and I was playing my very reformist role of Edri. Like, oh, let me try to bring you some solutions uh, that could work and could be implemented directly in the legislation you're talking about now. I was saying like, why not uh, build um, um, oversight body that is just composed of citizens and mostly people coming from marginalized communities, from racialized communities that are mostly impacted by uh, Europol's work. And the person looked at me and said, this is such a radical idea. And I was like, okay, <laughs> but that's level 101. <laughs> Um, you haven't even heard me on the rest <laughs> yet. Um, so yeah, that's just to illustrate what is ahead of us. And sorry for having this pessimist outlook, but this is this just to be pragmatic, as Ojaku said. That is perfect. Thank you, Chloe. Ojaku, 15 seconds, please. I'm, I'm just hoping uh, that then, No, that's fine, actually, because I think I said most of, uh, most of what I wanted to say around solutions anyway. I think the only thing that I would add is to follow the money. The money is the, the critical thing here. Like, if we stop increasing the budgets of all of these policing institutions, that would be one, like, massive help. Um, and stop investing money in, in prisons, incarceration, all of these sorts of things. Um, that would help. And then if we use that money somewhere else to, to reinvest into, into society, we would be much better off. Um, and it's actually kind of, it can be quite a reasonable thing to, to advocate for is like no more increasing of budgets. Very concise. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ajaku. Griff? Um, thanks. I mean, I think I'd just reiterate uh, something I said before, which is that we we really shouldn't be afraid to seek those imaginative and ambitious solutions. Um, for too long, we, all of us, we've been told and internalized what is and what isn't possible. And what's possible is what we make possible, um, whether that's less police, less prosecutions, less prisons. Um, and that involves, you know, not criminalizing people for society's problems, you know, not criminalizing people for poverty, for homelessness, for mental health problems uh, and other such things. And instead of criminalization, more help, more assistance, uh, and a more humane and, and dignified response to what are ultimately the, the ills of, of society. So what's, what's possible is what we make possible.